Welcome to Dig, a history podcast. We want to give a special thank you to a new Augur level patron, Christopher. Christopher, your generosity makes all of this possible. Thank you for supporting us. Listener, if you are not yet a patron, you can go to patreon.com slash digpodcast to learn more. In 1996, two college students went for a walk in the shallow waters of the Columbia River in Kennewick, Washington. As they waded through the water, they came across something neither expected. A human skull. They called the police. When the coroner arrived and they began to investigate the scene, they discovered not only a skull, but a nearly intact human skeleton buried in the sandy mud of the Columbia River. But while they were expecting the scene of a murder or body dump, what they actually discovered was something far different, although it too would wind up in the courts. The skeletal remains totally defied the coroner's expectations, and he called in a local archaeologist to help him understand what he was seeing. The skull was clearly very old, but didn't have characteristics that seemed to match the skulls of Native Americans, but also didn't have tooth decay from sugar, which might have indicated a European person. Eventually, local archaeologist James Chatters discovered a tiny sliver of something embedded in the hip bone of the skeleton. It was the very tip of a stone spearhead. Now it seemed clear that this person must have lived a very, very long time ago. And indeed, when the bones were carbon dated, they proved to be 9,000 years old. It turns out, instead of a modern murdered corpse, those college students had discovered the oldest human remains ever found in the Americas. Clearly, this ancient body had things it could teach scientists, archaeologists, anthropologists, and historians, ranging from fairly basic questions such as, where did he live? What did he eat? But also really, really major questions like, how did human beings first end up in North America? But while the Kennewick man represented scientific discovery to some, he represented an ancient ancestor to others. Native Americans from the Kennewick region claimed the skeleton as the remains of a beloved and revered forefather and demanded that the bones be returned to the earth. The resulting legal battle, which continued for some 20 years, pit science against culture in a way that linked into a very long, very contentious history of colonialism, racism, and violence. Today, we are talking about the Kennewick Man, but we're also talking about the longer history of the collection of Native American bones for scientific research and the efforts to return those bodies to their own communities for reburial. I am Sarah. And I'm Avril. And we are your historians for this episode of Dig. If you think back to an episode that Elizabeth wrote a few months ago about the development of natural history museums, you'll recall that during the 18th and 19th centuries, there was a growing desire to collect bits of the natural world in what collectors often called cabinets of curiosities. These museums often included interesting, unusual, or rare items that scientists used to better understand the world around them. But what Elizabeth did not talk about quite as much during that episode was the simultaneous growth of similar museums that collected interesting, unusual, or rare bits of human bodies, or what came to be known as anatomy museums. Right. And and I also will say here that um, another episode in this series, the episode that Elizabeth put together on miscarriage, also has some really strong overlaps with many of our themes today regarding anatomical collections and specimens in those collections. So there's a, some good overlap there. Cool. 
Now, uh, I want to be clear about something from the start. Anatomy museums and natural history museums sometimes overlapped, as in some natural history museums sometimes collected bits of human anatomy, but not always. And I think it's important to draw this distinction fairly early. In most institutions that fashioned themselves as natural history museums, if they collected any human remains, it was almost always from the bodies of people of color. And overwhelmingly, those people were Native Americans or other indigenous groups. These were people who were already assumed to be akin to animals, just a a part of nature rather than part of quote unquote civilization. Anatomy museums might also hold body parts or skeletal remains of Native people or other marginalized groups, but they are often collected not because of their value as part of the natural world, but more for their value to medical science. For instance, I have a chapter in my forthcoming book about one particular anatomy museum that we'll actually talk about more later on called the Army Medical Museum. This was in Washington, D.C., This was created during the Civil War to be a repository first for the bodies and body parts of wounded and dead American soldiers, with the idea that future doctors could learn from the horrific wounds that the war was creating. And the AMM goes on to hold the body parts of Native Americans and of other people. But say, you know, the Smithsonian Natural History Museum did not come to hold soldiers' bodies. See that kind of distinction between what kinds of bodies end up in natural history museums and what kinds of bodies end up in anatomy museums. Essentially, what I'm saying is white people's bodies usually don't go into natural history museums. Mm. There's no real hard and fast line between the two, of course, but this is a general difference. And we should also say that while the issue of collecting soldiers' bodies is also completely bonkers and, I think, super fascinating, we're not really going to talk about that here today. For that, you're going to have to read my book. <laughs> uh, and maybe, who knows, someday we'll come back and, and we'll talk about that in another episode. But it's not something we're going to talk about today. While the collection of skeletal and bodily remains has a longer history in Europe, we're mainly going to focus on the United States in this episode. This means we should probably start by talking about the man who was sort of the godfather of bone collecting in the U.S., Samuel George Morton. Morton was born in Philadelphia in 1799 and trained as a physician at the University of Edinburgh, one of the most prestigious medical schools in Europe. And I should say, I in in doing research with, I had always heard that University of Edinburgh was like one of the best of the best medical schools. It was pretty great. Um, but I also read that like at the time he was there, it was like in this weird period of decline. Like it had been super great, Mm -hmm. and then it was being sort of eclipsed by schools in like Paris and Vienna. Mm. So they were like maybe a little bit on the shabbier end at that point. But maybe they either way more restrictions on body snatching in Britain by then. Well, yeah, I mean, University of Edinburgh is where the Burke and Hare right. case is. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, maybe that was why. Yeah. I don't know. Just a thought. After he graduated, he returned to Philadelphia, where he became the Pennsylvania Medical College's anatomy professor. Uh, for his job as an anatomy, had a constant need for bodies and body parts. In a nutshell, it was like really, really hard to get bodies to use for medical education or research. Or yes. research, yeah. So Morton's collecting began as a way to have a supply of examples for his students to learn from. But as time went on, he shifted from wanting classroom learning tools to wanting to collect a wide variety of different kinds of skulls. By the time he died, he had somewhere around 1,000 human skulls in his collection. Yeah. After teaching for some time, he stepped down from his teaching post to concentrate full time on what he was really interested in, which was researching and writing about the human body. Morton identified as an ethnologist, a branch of science and medicine that concerned comparing human beings to one another. As Morton described it, ethnology, quote, compared the different races of man against one another uh, to learn more about how human beings should be categorized. I actually checked in with a friend of mine, um, an alum of my same college, Wells College, who is now an anthropologist about um, 
whether ethnology is still something that exists and its partner ethnography and how that fits into anthropology. And essentially she said, yes, those two things still exist. Yes, they are sort of akin to anthropology exists sort of within an umbrella of anthropology, but they're also sort of different. Um, I'm just going to say that's so far out of my lane. I'm not going to comment on it. Um, If you want to know more about those things, go talk to our friends, the anthropologists. But either way, this desire to categorize and organize came to Morton naturally. He was raised at the tail end of the Enlightenment. And from the time he was a small boy, he obsessively read the work of Philadelphia physician and general um, hound dog Benjamin Rush, who has weirdly appeared in a lot of our episodes lately. I don't know what that's about. The scientists, doctors, and thinkers of the Enlightenment, like Rush, wanted to unlock the mysteries of the world, not through prayer or religious study, but through the power of science. Many Enlightenment thinkers were also super into careful record keeping and obsessive measurements in the hopes that this data would help them better understand the natural world. For instance, Thomas Jefferson was super into the science of phenology, which involved keeping extremely precise records of when the first leaves of spring emerged or when the first raspberries ripened or when the first snowfall was. Now, this seems super tedious, but I'm actually really into this. And this still exists. And if you are interested, you should go to budburst.com and you yourself can become an amateur phenologist. Um, It is really fun and interesting. But anyway, you know, wait until after this episode to do that. I used to write that in my journal. Like, I saw the first robin, first snowfall today. It's the first day that uh, that it was, you know, below freezing. So I guess I just am a phenologist. I guess you are. Are you uh, part of that website? No, but I'm going to be. I just discovered it today. Or, you know, when I wrote this. Yesterday. Yeah, basically. (laughs) Actually, Thomas Jefferson's pastimes dabbling in science brings us to another reason why Morton became involved in ethnology. In 1785, Jefferson published his only full-length book, Notes on the State of Virginia. He wrote the book sort of accidentally, and when he published a bunch of short notes and essays, he prepared to answer the questions of Francois Barbois, the secretary of the French legation in America during the American Revolution. Barb Marbois had assembled something like 20 questions about Virginia. Things like, describe the boundaries of Virginia. Describe the colleges and public establishments. Is he a spy? Is he, like, trying to figure out ways to invade himself? Or? No, 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 no. He was just like, I don't understand America. Ah. Like, explain this to me. What's so great about it? Mm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's like a crazy comprehensive exam in Virginian culture or, yeah. or something. And, yeah, it's wild. And the... Uh, What's his face? Jefferson was like, I see your spades and I raise you $15. Yes, exactly. Um, so anyway, part of Jefferson's motivations in his answers to Barb Marbois' questions was to rebut the theories of French naturalist Georges-Louis Leclerc, Comte de Buffon, who argued that the Americas could not boast of having any huge mammals and that the indigenous peoples were also all small. His point being that the Americas were unhealthy and inferior and that um, Europeans who moved there would degrade. Jefferson set out to argue against Buffon by arguing that actually America had lots of big things uh, like moose. (laughs) He even argues about the relative sizes of various animals. He throws in mammoths, which were a... quite huge yes. one might say mammoth in size <laughs> wow <laughs> um with this very hilarious shade the bones of the mammoth which have been found in america are as large as those found in the old world it may be asked why i insert the mammoth as if it still existed i ask in return why should i admit it as if it did not exist <laughs> I know. Oh, it's it's so funny. He's very sassy. He was very, yeah, he was very much like, you're ridiculous. Um, yeah, it, Jefferson, I just, he's great. Okay. 
Uh, notes on the state of Virginia is important for a great number of reasons, not the least of which is Jefferson's overtly racist discussion of the bodies of enslaved blacks, which is rich, you know, considering the long term relationship he had with his own enslaved woman, Sally Hemings, and the several mixed race children that he had with her. But, you know, that's a really complicated story that we can get into maybe another day. What's important for us here are two things. First, Jefferson's preoccupation with size helped to cement the idea that bigger is better. Insert, you know, laugh track here. Except it's also how you use it. <laughs> and and Jefferson used it. He used it. Ugh, okay. What a dirty old bastard. <laughs> uh, he was a ginger. Okay. Anyway, that has nothing to do with it, but all right. Okay, where am I going here? Um, okay. In this case, uh, th- that size was an indication of intelligence and civilization. Morton applied this general idea to his examination of human skulls. One of the things Jefferson noted in his notes, for instance, is that while scientists could speculate that, say, blacks were inferior to whites in, quote, faculties of reason and imagination, this was actually really hard to quantify and it would take a lot of careful scientific study to actually prove like he's warning them right like you can make this claim but scientifically you're gonna have to do a lot of actual work to prove that that is actually true which is interesting right that jefferson is saying that during the 19th century morton and other naturalists would try to use scientific disciplines to try to determine which races were the most advanced and which were the most inferior. The science that Morton embraces and which purports to be the solution of Jefferson's dilemma was craniometry, a science that involved the careful measurement and observation of human skulls. And we'll come back to craniometry in just a second. But first, we want to explain the second reason Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia are important. In notes, Jefferson also spends some time contemplating the issue of mounds. For a long time, European Americans had argued that the earthen mounds that existed across the U.S. were the product of a vanished white race. It's very Joseph Smithy. Yes. Okay. Yes. This all kind of ties in together. There was Mm. another book that I wanted to include um, that was called The Lost White Tribe that Mm. just traces the history of people claiming that there were lost white tribes like in Africa or in Hmm. South America or wherever. How desperate. Yeah, yeah. Super interesting. Um, So basically they believe that these white people had been there and and had built them because obviously Native Americans were incapable and that's there's no other explanation but that white people did it. Mm -hmm. That's like the pyramids in Great Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. All the others. Okay. Jefferson thought that was ridiculous and instead postulated that they were actually burial mounds. Ever the scientist, Jefferson was not happy to just write about his theory and took the logical next step of having the mounds excavated. I'm sure he asked permission before he did that. Yep. I intentionally used the passive voice there because as a wealthy planter and politician, you know Jefferson was not out there shovel in hand. He instead supervised as his enslaved men dug up the mounds. And lo and behold, the mound was full of the skeletal remains. Jefferson actually acted more or less exactly like an archaeologist, investigating the condition of the bones and artifacts to conclude that the mounds were used for the burial of common people. In other words, they weren't like the pyramids, set aside for the wealthy and powerful, or monuments to dead soldiers in some war. They were just sort of common. Which was kind of his hypothesis at Mm -hmm. the beginning. He actually was like, oh, this was probably where they buried the elite, or maybe it was uh, some place where they buried dead warriors. Mm. And then he, through his investigation, finds that's not the case. That's not true. So in notes, not only does he describe his own scientific research, but he also goes on to defend Native Americans from de Buffon, who claimed that they were essentially stupid, lazy, and impotent, and Jefferson calls all that nonsense. But... At the same time, Jefferson created a kind of natural history museum to the entrance of Monticello, displaying the bones of those mastodons alongside gathered and unearthed indigenous artifacts. 
In this way, Jefferson cemented the idea that Native Americans were part of the natural landscape of the new United States and belonged to the country in the same way that deer or bear or turtles did. So this is really complicated, and I want to so I want to sum this up with two great sentences from archaeologist David Hurst Thomas. Quote, this is why archaeology textbooks, including my own, canonize Thomas Jefferson as America's first scientific archaeologist. It is also why many modern Indians see him as America's first scientific grave robber. Let's go back to Morton and craniometry. Today, craniometry is considered a pseudoscience as well as a form of scientific racism. And we'll put some images up in the show notes that illustrate this, but craniometry included all sorts of different kinds of measurements of skulls and heads, including things like the volume capacity of the skull, uh, which would indicate brain size, and the angle of the face. All of these measurements were believed to indicate something about the inferiority or superiority of not just that individual person, but all people belonging to that race. Morton believed that races were not just natural variation within humankind, but that humans were actually made up of many different species. And like the Comte de Buffon and Thomas Jefferson believed, their physical features revealed the superiority or inferiority of each species. Morton's craniometry focused on measuring cranial capacity and the belief that this indicated brain size, which he believed correlated directly to intellectual capacity. And by this, Morton didn't just mean intelligence, but also other traits associated with the mind, rationality, ingenuity, inventiveness, creativity, and imagination, for instance. Morton and his colleagues also believed that all living creatures had a natural hierarchy, with human beings naturally on top. So by collecting skulls, Morton and his colleagues believed that they could better understand each different species of humankind and ultimately be able to understand their hierarchy. During the 1820s, Morton joined a group of like-minded scientists and doctors called the Academy of Natural Sciences. This group met regularly, but had no cash, so they usually met at one of their houses or at an ice cream shop. <laughs> Which is so, so cute. <laughs> you see, like, licking their cones and talking about mastodons. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wonder if they had chocolate dip. At one point, however, a wealthy amateur geologist named William McClure funded the group, allowing them to establish a library and start a natural history collection. In 1825, McClure up and left Philadelphia to join a utopian society in Indiana. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Leaving Morton in charge of running the academy. It was as the director of the society that Morton's collecting really got underway. Now he had contacts he could call on to send him things. Unlike other collectors, Morton did not go out and dig up specimens himself, instead drawing on his network of colleagues to send him things they found in their travels. While most collections included a wide variety of natural specimens, Morton specialized in skulls alone. Soon, people were sending Morton's skulls from all over the place. As historian Anne Fabian recounts, quote, his 138 donors included missionaries in Africa, doctors in Florida and Cuba, diplomats in Mexico and Cairo, white settlers sulking through hot summers in Indiana, soldiers in Georgia, explorers in the Arctic, scientists in Oregon, and a president of Venezuela. They remembered Morton on their summer tramps and expeditions and whenever they chanced on dead bodies. One thing that I find fascinating about this massive skull collection that Morton had was that his friends sometimes wrote and teased him about what they would refer to as his personal Golgotha. Um, and Golgotha is a reference to the place where Jesus was crucified outside of the walls of Jerusalem. Um, this place was named Golgotha, which was the place of the skull. So I just think that was a, an, an interesting little piece here. In 1839, Morton published his magnum opus, Crania Americana. In the book, Morton demonstrated that white people had the largest brains. Surprise, surprise, right? Averaging 87 cubic inches. Black people had the smallest, averaging 78 cubic inches, and Native Americans were somewhere in the middle at 82 cubic inches. Hmm. 
He was able to calculate this brain capacity by filling skulls with stuff to measure their volume. After trying many different kinds of materials, he first he start he tries like mustard seeds and things like that. He um he eventually landed on BB sized lead shot. He correlated these volume measurements directly to intelligence, behavior, and level of civilization. He also used some of the principles of phrenology, not phenology, but phrenology, in which you discern personality, behavior, and other traits by reading the shape and bumps of the skull. Um, And he used phrenology to develop what to him seemed like a truly accurate scientific understanding of the way that entire races of people thought and acted, or what Morton referred to as, quote, national traits. According to Morton, his measurements proved, and again, I'm going to quote here from archaeologist David Hurst Thomas, quote, that Caucasians were the superior race with Teutons and Anglo-Saxons on the top, Jews in the middle, and Hindus on the bottom. He found that the Eskimo of Greenland to be, quote, crafty, sensual, ungrateful, obstinate, and unfeeling. Their mental faculties from infancy to old age present a continued childhood. The Chinese were almost as bad, a, quote, monkey race. And the black Hottentots were like, quote, the lower animals. Um, and just to point out here, he, he, he didn't know anything about these people. He based all of that on their skulls. Um. So that's pretty bad. But Morton's theories actually got much worse. So, yeah. We mentioned before that Morton and his ilk believed that there weren't just different races of humans, but that the different races actually constituted different species. One of the sticking points of biology and other natural sciences in the 19th century was how this related to the creation. Of course, at this point, there was really no alternative theory to the one taught in the Bible, that a deity created the earth in six days, including humans and animals and literally everything else. Uh, This is before Darwin's On the Origin of Species and other publications. So 19th century scientists were operating within what was essentially a biblical interpretation of science. The problem was with how the races or species of humans related to the original creation. Were all the various races all products of the same creation? In other words, were all people, black, white, red, yellow, as 19th century people conceived of them, descendants of Adam and Eve? Or were there multiple creations producing each race in its own way? This question wasn't just philosophical or theological. It had really critical political ramifications. If all human beings were really descendants from the same common ancestors, then they were essentially equals. And if that were the case, America had pretty serious problems. I think we're all familiar with the inherent contradiction of declaring that all Americans have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, while also keeping black men and women in chattel slavery, a problem that we often think of as the American paradox or the Jeffersonian dilemma. Lots of Thomas Jefferson here. Here he is. If science proved that all Americans, and indeed all humans worldwide, were descendants from the same creation... How could anyone justify enslavement or other forms of oppression? Right. But Morton's scientific findings in Crania Americana, he argued, indicated that that was not the case. How convenient, right? Mm. Rather, the various skull capacities indicated that human beings were created at different times and were not all descendant from a single creation, and certainly not all from Adam and Eve, who Mm. were, of course, white. White. Uh, His findings seemed to offer scientific proof that white people were created by God to be superior to his other lesser creations. Now, I'm going to interrupt myself here to say um, one thing that I I was not able to find and that I'd be really curious about is when they say multiple creations, I wonder if what they mean is as, as God is going through the, if you read Genesis, right, God's going through the various stages of creation um, and at one point creates animals right and then creates humans so i'm assuming that those other creations were part of that animal creation i don't know that 
if you read it literally, you know, create animals, then we create Adam and Eve. It's not like they said, and then they went to America and did another one, you know. So I'm assuming they interpreted that as being those creations as being of the animal world. Do you know what I'm saying? That those people were fundamentally animals and not humans. Okay. Yeah. This, uh, of course, justified slavery. In fact, a Southern Medical Journal lauded Morton as a kind of patron saint, writing in 1851, actually just uh, not long after Morton died, quote, we of the South should consider him as our benefactor for aiding most materially in giving to the Negro his true position as an inferior race. The black race was not as advanced as the white race, not because of unequal access to education or oppression or any other environmental reason, but because of their biological makeup. A similar line of reasoning was applied, of course, to Native Americans. In 1855, Oliver Wendell Holmes, the famous writer and physician, wrote a poem in which he declared that, quote, The red man was a sketch in red crayons of a rudimental manhood to keep the continent from being a blank until the true lord of creation should come to claim it. In other words, Morton's scientific findings solidified what most white Americans already believed, or at least wanted to believe. Native Americans were fundamentally placeholders. This allowed Americans to continue to believe in the trope of the noble savage while also justifying what amounted to a genocide in order to clear the land of tribes from the Atlantic to the Pacific. It's like their placeholders, they were fine as they were, but they were not white and whites were the ideal. So, so yeah, like they were, they are kind of like holding down the fort until like mommy and daddy got home mm-hmm. and then it was time for them to like accept their place as inferiors ideally just go away completely right. Right. yeah okay today we would call morton's theories a form of biological determinism in other words the theory that your biological makeup dictates everything about you not only your eye color or hair color but also your behavior and decisions It was their biological makeup that made Native Americans resist the U.S. government's treaties or fight back against the U.S. Army, even though we know now that signing treaties or surrendering surrendering was often detrimental to tribal interests. It also meant that they were incapable of actually joining the ranks of the American citizenry. You know, this this whole theory. Mm -hmm. Um, They could never be truly, quote unquote, civilized. In fact, while most people understood that they were human, They did not believe they were fully human in the same way that African Americans were not fully human. They were more akin to animals. This was a self-confirming theory because it didn't just pave the way for decimating native populations, but also for collecting their bodies and skulls in the name of science. They were really more animals than humans. Right, like the theory, Right. they created the theory that confirmed what they already wanted to believe which allowed them to continue to do what they were doing. Morton's theories only seemed to be confirmed as the century wore on. As Charles Darwin's theories of evolution and natural selection were published and made their way into the scientific canon, they seemed to validate Morton's general theories. The idea that Native Americans were truly a separate species became modified slightly into Darwin's theory of evolution. For example, Lewis Henry Morgan, a Rochester-based lawyer with a passion for ethnography, began to argue that Native Americans living in the 19th century were the last of a vastly changed and ultimately vanishing breed. Morgan established his career in ethnography by writing a book about the history and culture of the Haudenosaunee. In 1851, he published his first book, The League of the Haudenosaunee, or Iroquois, with the help of Seneca Ely S. Parker, who had served, actually, on General Ulysses S. Grant's staff during the Civil War. In the book, Morgan argued that Native American cultures were no longer what they were. In other words, All the real Indians were dead, and the living Indians were sort of a watered-down version of the real thing. And this is something that actually comes up throughout the 19th century and early 20th century, this idea of authentic Indians, that the Indians living at that time in the late 19th century were not the real thing. Um, And what happens, especially as Native Americans become part of sort of tourist culture, as white people go and like go and see their you know 
authentic Indian villages or as they travel with Wild Bill or whatever, um, Indians trying to behave and present themselves in what white people called authentic Indian culture and therefore kind of altering their own cultures in order to appear more authentic in the eyes of white people. It's a it's a completely bonkers. That disturbs me. <clears throat> yeah, it should. Yeah. Later in his career, Morgan refined his theories to parallel the general theories of Charles Darwin. In books published in 1870 and 1871, he argued that all of humanity was on a path of social evolution. All of humankind was on a kind of evolutionary ladder, with the least civilized at the bottom and the most at the top. Morgan separated people into three main categories, savages at the bottom, barbarians in the middle, and civilized at the top. Groups could move on that hierarchy, but only so far. For instance, Native Americans began in utter savagery, he argued, but some groups, like the Haudenosaunee, had defied their inferior mental status to reach the status of middle barbarianism. Yeah. Woohoo! Woohoo! This might sound vaguely familiar. That's because it's virtually the same thing as social Darwinism, the most mainstream racial pseudoscience of the 19th and early 20th century, also based on the theories or the bastardization of the well, theories right, yeah. of Charles Darwin. Yeah, I don't mean literally based on, but like right. inspired by right. the theories of Darwin. Social Darwinism was first articulated by Francis Galton, Darwin's cousin, described humanity in very similar terms. All of humankind was on an evolutionary ladder with the most evolved on top and the least on the bottom. While it was possible for races or groups to become more evolved, after all, everyone was constantly in the process of evolution, those that were biologically determined to be superior would always be on top. This was the perfect way to rectify the trope of the noble savage with the belief that Native Americans needed to make way for white folks. The ultimate oppression of Native Americans wasn't because white people were cruel or greedy, but because it was the inevitable, biologically determined result of the evolutionary process. Right. It allows people to believe that there can be, quote unquote, good Indians mm -hmm. and that some Indians can be, quote unquote, civilized. Mm -hmm. But they also still that doesn't mean that they don't have to get out of the way. Right. Right. They can they can have both things at once. Of course, this also meant that for most 19th century Americans, the bodies of native people weren't really human bodies. While Americans had strict expectations about how white bodies should be treated after death, they did not extend those same beliefs to those lower on the evolutionary ladder. This coincided with two other important factors in the second half of the 19th century. First, after the Civil War ended, the U.S. Army found itself with more men than ever, men which they used to bring Native Americans to heel in the West. This period, which we know sort of colloquially as the Indian Wars, resulted in an incredible loss of Indian lives from a combination of pitched battle, sickness, exposure, starvation, and of course, massacres at the hands of white troops. Second, America was building its first national natural history and anatomy museums, the Smithsonian Institution and the Army Medical Museum. Smaller collections and museums also cropped up all around the United States. The result was a pretty serious demand for specimens to fill all those new museums. For instance, when naturalist Louis Agassi was getting desperate for bodies to fill his new museum at Harvard, he wrote directly to Secretary of War Edwin Stanton to request the right to Native American bodies killed or at least discovered by the U.S. Army. He writes this, quote, Let me have the bodies of some Indians. All that would be necessary would be to forward the body express in a box. In case the weather was not very cold, direct the surgeon in charge to inject through the carotids a solution of arsenic of soda. I should like one or two handsome fellows and the heads of two or three more. <sighs> in the case of the Army Medical Museum, which we'll call the AMM heretofore, which was run by the Army itself in 1862, Surgeon General William A. Hammond had actually mandated that surgeons keep all interesting or important cases and forward them directly to the museum. During the war, this applied to soldiers, 
but after the war, it was mostly used with the bodies of Native Americans. One surgeon sent specimen after specimen from the Dakota territories. The first was a, quote, squaw having remarkable beauty, followed by an old man, quote, who died at his post on the 7th day of January, 1869, and was buried in his blankets and furs in the ground about half a mile from the fort. The surgeon wrote in the note that accompanied the head that he had snuck out to disinter the man's head when he believed the man's family and friends would not be watching. Quote, I secured the head in the night of the day he was buried. From the fact he was buried near these lodges, I did not know but what I was suspected in this business and that it was their intention to keep watch over the body. Believing that they would hardly think I would steal his head before he was cold in the grave, I early in the evening with two of my hospital attendants secured this specimen. Anthropologist Simon Harrison has interpreted stories like this one as evidence that bone collecting was not purely motivated by scientific interest. Mm -hmm. Instead, he, and others we should say, argue that these stories have a lot in common with stories of adventure, hunting, and trophy gathering, sneaking about, dodging danger, avoiding the watchful eyes of those who might be protecting the bodies. Hunting for specimens was itself a form of adventure. Yeah, and I um, I said that I wasn't going to talk about my chapter, but I'll just tell you very, very quickly that I find the same thing uh, happening during the Civil War. For instance, John Brinton, who works, uh, he's one of the first curators of the Army Medical Museum, writes in his memoirs the story of, of collecting a, a whole bag of bones And then having to cross the Rappahannock um, in the middle of the night while Confederate snipers are are shooting down at them. And he's like, you know, we were dodging bullets and we were trying not to drown and the current was really... And it's like written in this way that's very much like military memoir. You know, this was like a a military exploit. Um, And it kind of turns into this form of adventure rather than just kind of like oh purely in the name of science we're just collecting things as we see them instead it was something that kind of confirmed their masculinity in the same sort of way that military service did Mm -hmm. but often it, it didn't actually take much daring do for military surgeons to do their collecting it was incredibly common for military surgeons to descend on sites of massacres to collect body parts for the amm Military surgeon B. E. Fryer was quick to descend after some soldiers and local men murdered a group of Pawnee as they stopped by a white owned farm to trade. Fry immediately dispatched an envoy to gather the heads of the murdered Pawnee men, but only managed to get a few before a blizzard and some offended Pawnee arrived. When the weather cleared, Fry was back at it. By the time he was done, he sent 26 cleaned and prepared skulls to Washington, including the skulls of dead Cheyenne, Caddo, Wichita, and Osage members. Just to give you an idea of what this looked like, again, I want to quote directly here from David Hurst Thomas, quote, Fryer was particularly proud of his Pawnee specimens, four of which were recovered in prime condition, but two others, unfortunately, and this is, you know, part of Fry's reports, were injured a good deal by the soldiers who shot into the bodies and heads several times in the fight in which these Indians were killed. Now, I find that so telling. He's talking about these people who were slaughtered, right? They're, they've been murdered. And what he's actually lamenting isn't that they've been killed, but that his specimens have been damaged in the process. Over the course of four years, Fryer sent to the Army Medical Museum 42 Native American skulls, adding to the over 800 that the museum already had. There are so many more stories like these, and we could go on and on and on about bone collecting and bodies on display in museums. But we want to come back to the Kennewick Man before we close. We don't mean to suggest that this is the whole story. Just take a look at the show notes to see just a sampling of some of the many books written on this topic. And we hope you'll read one or two of them if you're interested 
in this. You know, ex- yeah, explore yeah. further. And if you do read them, you know, let us know what you yeah, read and what you do. saw in in the Dig Pod Squad or on Twitter. Yeah, and if you find some aspect of it that you want us to do another episode on, please. I mean, and I could talk know. about this stuff all day long. Yeah, but anyway, uh, let's let's close by talking about the Kennewick man. Let's return to that that mm-hmm. opening story. Right. Remember, he's the skeleton that was found in the Columbia River in Washington in 1996. We mentioned that the Kennewick man was determined to be the oldest skeleton ever discovered in North America. And anthropologists hoped that he might be able to help them uncover one of the great mysteries of North American settlement. Did humans arrive in North America, either by foot across the land bridge that once connected Siberia and Alaska, or maybe by canoe? Or did they already exist in North America well before they could ever have traveled across the land bridge? Some anthropologists believe that the Kennewick man must be evidence of the land bridge theory because they argued he had Caucasoid features. They believed, based on their own measurements and analyses, that the skull could not be Native American, at least as we know them today, and was therefore evidence that so-called Caucasian people migrated to North America first. But other anthropologists, rightly so, found this to be super problematic. The measurements that scientists used, and often what scientists still use to determine the race of the person who produced a skull or a bone, is based on comparison to centuries of studies on other skulls and bones. But how was race determined in those bones used as the constant? For the most part, it was based on the scientific work of those ethnographers like Morton and Morgan and the military surgeons of the AMM. As David Hurst Thomas says, in other words, the baseline racial labels in the reference collections reflect little more than folk stereotypes. They made no allowances for a variety of factors that could change the measurements of those skulls. Natural selection, genetic drift, disease, acclimatization, stress, etc. So in incredibly overly simplified terms, we used our own racial assumptions to create the science of race, which we now use to determine race. Mm. And that's really complicated, right? And it, I'm going to be perfectly honest here and say, I'm not an anthropologist. I, I'm not even a historian, really, of race. Um, and so this is all really tough and complicated stuff. But I find that so wild that we we use our own cultural understandings of what race was to create the idea of race. Right. And now we look at bones and we say, objectively, I can say that that's right. a black skull because of this objective science when it's not objective at all. It's not objective. No, at not all. at all. Hmm. Um, but either way, calling the Kennewick man Caucasoid is essentially calling him white that's... in America today, right? Because we think of the term Caucasian as meaning right white like we are now which is stupid mm-hmm. because this guy is nine thousand years old and what did that even mean yeah. you know anyway uh, i think we can all see the implications of this uh, newspaper and other media reports of the kennewick man often made a big deal of the fact that he was caucasoid or caucasian in addition to being the oldest known inhabitant of north america mm-hmm. this suggested two things One, that race is immutable and has been since the dawn of time. Right, Right. that Caucasoid meant Caucasoid meant Caucasoid. Right. Always. And second, that white people were here first. Right. Casual readers latched on to that idea. In fact, a group called the Asatru Folk Assembly, which is made up of former KKK and Aryan Nation members, latched on to the idea that white people were in America first as evidence that this is fundamentally a land for white people. Lewis Beam, a member of this group, wrote an article called Dead Indians Don't Lie, in which he argues that the Kennewick Man is the scientific evidence for a white America. So that's some... That's really, really scary and dangerous stuff, right? Yeah. But the Kennewick Man is also problematic for the same reason as all the other skulls and bones mentioned in this episode are problematic. He is another instance where scientists claimed a human body and kept it without the honor of a burial in the name of science. For some Americans, this body is not the Kennewick Man, but the ancient one an ancestor who belongs with the tribe. 
But soon after discovering his incredible age, scientists actually very quickly made moves to protect their rights to the skeleton. They were up against a law called the Native Americans Grave Protection and Repatriation Act, passed in 1990, which requires that all agencies and institutions that receive federal funding return any so-called Native American cultural items to their tribes. This landmark law recognizes that bodily remains and other items were essentially stolen in the name of science. You know, let's not even say essentially. They were stolen in the name of science and that bodily remains in particular deserve to be reunited with their tribal descendants and given a proper burial. Kennewick Man was very old. And scientists knew that his body could be reclaimed under NAGPRA, so they took steps to keep him. In 1997, and and by steps, we mean they they took this case to court, right? Mm. In 1997, a judge actually agreed, stating that his body, the, the Kennewick man's body, was, quote, a book that they, scientists, could read, a history written in bone instead of on paper, Just as the history of a region may be read by analyzing layers of rock or ice or the rings of a tree. The echoes of Morton and Morgan and others are really obvious in that quote. This Native American body is the same thing as a tree or a rock, something to be studied and kept in a natural history museum, and certainly not requiring or deserving a burial. Now, we should acknowledge this is straight up complicated, Old bones can teach us stuff. Right. And I mean, that's like my entire episode on syphilis was about Mm. studying bones to determine the origin of syphilis. Right. But what's the line between learning from the dead and perpetuating out of date racist thinking and systems of oppression? Well, the tribes of the area where Kennewick Man, uh, the ancient one, was found, demanded that he be returned to them under NAGPRA, just as the scholars feared. But in order for them to win the case, they had to prove that they had a direct genetic link to the ancient one. After almost two decades, in 2015, it was found that the ancient one was genetically linked to the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation. And in 2016, the Army Corps of Engineers confirmed the findings and finally returned the body to five tribes who all claimed shared relation to the Kennewick Man. Just last year, in February 2017, 200 members of the five tribes, the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation, the Confederated Tribes and Bands of the Yakama Nation, the Nez Perce, the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Reservation, and the Wanapum Band of Priest Rapids, all came together to bury the Ancient One in a secret location. Yeah, so this has kind of a, I mean, a kind of a happy ending, right? I mean, they... They are able to get him back. But I find it really, really interesting that the only way that they could get him back is if they could prove that he was genetically linked to them. Um, And that in itself is sort of problematic, right? I mean, why is it that we can only honor through burial, which is, you know, all human beings have a belief about what what should happen to bodies after death, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Why is it that we can only honor ones that, are linked in some way to us, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, why not just honor him because he's a human being and he's dead? Now, I can also see on the flip side of that, people being able to argue, but we really can learn from them. Yes. I mean, this brings me back to a conversation that we had years ago about the the bodies that were unearthed here in Buffalo um, at UB South Campus, mm-hmm. which was the site of the old Erie uh, County Alms House. Yes. And those bodies were held for years by the anthropology department Mm -hmm. at UB. Mm -hmm. Um, And you can learn things from old bodies, right? But at the same time, that also requires keeping human remains on a shelf. Yeah. um, Which I, I, I personally, I just, I find that really problematic. And then again, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a scientist. I think about human bodies in, in ways that are informed by culture and society and not informed by my commitment to a profession. Right. Um, so I think it's probably very obvious how I feel. I feel pretty strongly about this. This is something I've been researching and thinking about for a long time now. And, and so um, 
I really struggle to put myself into the, the, the shoes sometimes of those doctors and, and scientists who are so gleeful to decapitate the bodies of murdered Native Americans, put them in a box and send them to Washington. Yeah. I mean, I agree with you and feel the same way in terms of the disrespecting of people's cultures. Mm -hmm. But I mean... If it was my body, I'll probably donate myself to science or whatever. But that's a there's a big difference right. there, right? That's there's a agency big difference. And versus yeah. oppression and yeah. assuming that a particular people don't deserve the respect that you would give your own people. Right. Yeah. Um, no, I think that's actually a really important point that like today, much of what we know, much of how doctors learn how to be doctors comes from people who have generously donated their bodies to science, mm -hmm. right? Um, in fact, the at UB North, um, when you, one of the exits at, on UB North, if you drive out that exit, there's a tiny little cemetery there mm -hmm. um, on the other side of the Audubon. Do you know mm -hmm. what I'm talking mm -hmm. about? Mm -hmm. um, and in that cemetery, there is a, a gravestone where all of the cremated remains of all of the people who donate their bodies to the, the UB medical school mm -hmm. are interred there. And they have a ceremony once a year where they honor all of those people. They re read all the names. Um, and that's, I think that's really powerful acknowledging both that we need human remains in order to understand how human bodies work and to yeah. make it possible for us to make other humans lives better. Yeah. But we also need to respect and honor them in ways that, you know, humans respect and honor deceased people. Yeah. Um, yeah. Lest we devolve into chaos and eat our dead. <laughs> sure. Yeah. This is, um, I just, I recently taught The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, which mm -hmm. Avril really enjoyed. I made her read it and she, she liked it a whole bunch. Whole bunch! Uh, <laughs> Um, but it actually was really interesting to me because I, the class that I assigned it in are all students who are, are mostly pre-med mm -hmm. or they're bio majors. Right. So they think like scientists yeah. and they don't think like humanities folks. Um, and it was fun to see them trying to wrap their head around this, trying to kind of think like, oh, wait, those cells were taken without consent and people right. profited off of those cells and oh they're it, this is not just an objective sort of well we're just learning from some things what that has nothing to do with you or your mom like it's just a cell right right seeing them kind of make that transition in their brains was really neat and and having these complex because there's no easy answers necessarily mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. these questions um so yeah this is why we talked about this in the science episode but this is why Folks in the sciences and the STEM fields really need to learn this history yep. so that, you know, this kind of thing isn't perpetuated because this stuff can still happen today. Yes. You know? And there are plenty of Native American bones and other people's bones that are still in museums and aren't being reburied. Right. And should be. So a couple things. Make sure you join us in the Dig History Pod Squad on Facebook so yes. that you can, you know, share with us when you read some of these books from Sarah's show notes. Um, and when you find other examples of this sort of complicated issue of scientists and racial theory and skeletons and remains mm -hmm. and what to do with them, because, you know, the, the Kennewick man is... Certainly not the only example of this. No, not at all. Even in the last, like, 15, 20 years, right? Mm -hmm. No, there's tons of examples. Tons of them. Yeah. Yeah. So we'd love to hear what you find as mm -hmm. you're digging into this history. Um, mm -hmm. You can also chat with us, connect with us on Twitter, on Instagram at dig underscore history. Um, and we hope you've enjoyed this episode. Uh, help us reach new listeners. Leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or Google Play or wherever you're listening. And as always, you can find the complete transcript and bibliography for this episode at digpodcast.org. Thanks yep. for listening. Thank you. Bye. With Teutons and Anglo-Saxons on top. You don't say Teutons? With Teutons. You can't say Teutons. Barb Marbois. Marbois. Barb Marbois. Barb Marbois. Barb Marbois. Barb Marbois. Rayons of a rudimental. Rudimental? Is that the right word? Okay. Well, he said rudimental, but. I'm having a MRSA issue, breathing wise. Okay. Fundamentally, a land for white people. Fundamentally. That was me being Elizabeth. No, just kidding.
1839, Morton published his magnum Otis. 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 In the entrance to Monticello. Cello. Monticello? Mm -hmm. It's Iowa, that's Monticello. Got it. Darwin's half cousin and half cousin. Can you be that's a what cousin? Wikipedia said. Half cousin. That's like yeah. <laughs> I, that's what it said. That's all I can tell you. I don't know how you can be a half cousin. Yeah, how do you? You're just a cousin. It said half cousin. Like, take it up with Wikipedia. Only the left nut contributed. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that means like third cousin. Twice removed. Maybe it means that he was adopted. I have no idea. Oh my god. Okay. 